Um, welcome to the plenary hall. Um, our next speaker is a Python developer at the Centre for Australian Weather and Climate Research at the Bureau of Meteorology. Uh, she's a regular presenter at PyCon Australia and uh, her presentation this year is on dynamic visualisation with the IPython notebook. Please welcome Brianna Law. Hi everyone, thanks for coming along. Uh, now, all my slides and code are available on GitHub if you want to download them and play along or just to save taking notes. Now, I work in the research department of the Bureau of Meteorology and we have an IPython notebook set up for collaborating with the remote members of our team. So we have a lot of gridded data that we need to work with, that we want to explore, that we want to uh, modify in different ways and look at the result to see if we're making an improvement in some fashion. So it's very easy with the IPython notebook because of its matplotlib support to plot that out. Um, as you can see, this is an example of some data which is a forecast for minimum temperature around Tasmania. And because it's kind of geographically based, maybe we'd like to take a closer look at a particular area. This is a plot that's kind of zoomed in around the lat long that represents Hobart. But that's not really a super ideal solution for really exploring this data in detail. So we can't, we can't zoom in really, like it's a little bit awkward. We can't pan, we can't move side to side to have a a more dynamic look at what's there, and we can't easily add multiple layers to matplotlib. So matplotlib plots uh, with a lot of backends. So for example, if you use a Q uh, QT, I think, or TK ag backend, they'll actually pop up a separate window uh, on your desktop, and you can, you can play with those interactively. But for the ones that are uh, embedded inline in the notebook, you can't really interact with them in the same way. So, because we're, we're dealing with gridded data, so what we, what we really want is a map interface. So we'd like something like this. We just want to have something simple that we can pass all the relevant parameters to and have a proper actual map there. You know, these JavaScript people know what they're doing. They've got all the mapping stuff sorted, so let's just use that. So just briefly to talk about the data that I'm using in this example, uh, it's from a service that the Bureau provides called the Australian Digital Forecast Database. Uh, there's links to it. You can download the sample grids for a bunch of different weather parameters like minimum temperature, maximum temperature, uh, sea level pressure, uh, wind speeds, uh, percentage of precipitation, these kinds of things. And these grids are also, these grids are the output of the project that I work on and they feed into the Bureau's new web app which is called MedEye. It's only just recently released, so do have a look at it, it's quite cool. You can get uh, all the different parameters on the left for your particular location. And of course you can interact with it like a map, which is nice. So if we think about what are the things that we need to get in place to have our map in our notebook, um, this, is, this is one way we can do it. And what I'm going to do is talk us through each of these steps actually working backwards. And we're going to see how do we need to set those up and configure those so that they can all play nice together. So yeah, NetCDF is just a quite common data format that's used for gridded data, uh, it could be HDF5 or something like that that we're dealing with as well. Um, and that's just a common format that is quite popular in oceanography and climatology. So if you're interested in that kind of data, you probably are already familiar with it. So if you have been paying attention at all, you've probably heard about the notebook quite a few times this weekend. And I'm just going to echo what everyone else says. and say that I think it's a really useful um, tool for working with uh, remote people and working with people who maybe are not as comfortable as you are at just opening a script in a text editor and, and modifying it. And I also think it's a really great uh, tool for your own purposes when you're exploring a new API. So for example, matplotlib is kind of finicky and because the 
uh, support from Matplotlib is already built into the notebook, it's perfect if you need to remember oh, what parameter do I need to set to change this axis or change the colour of this plot. You can keep all your working recorded there so that uh, when you go back later you don't you didn't, you know, delete that because that was just a working step. You still got it available. Um, so setting it up is really easy, and then we run it with PyLab inline so that our images are embedded in the page instead of popping up separately. Now, IPython Notebook has what they like to call this rich display system, and so uh, you might have seen already that it can embed LaTeX and all these different types of images and also JSON and HTML, and we're just using the HTML. Uh, the current version of the notebook is only like 0.13, um, and they have a pretty detailed roadmap for improving support for a lot of this, and in particular, they have mentioned that they want to make improvements to JavaScript. So I would say watch this space, and what I'm doing may not be uh, applicable in the future. There's probably going to be easier ways of doing this, I would suggest. Um, but to make, if you have some classes, either your own code or even someone else's code, but you would like to be able to inspect it more easily and have nice visualizations in the notebook, all you need to do is add uh, some kind of, so to, to make it have an image, add like a ping method and have it return an instance of uh, this image, which image class which we've imported from IPython display. And then when you're in the notebook, you'll be able to just do you know, foo dot ping, and it will embed in the um, notebook. So that's a really, it's actually quite simple to uh, add support to your own classes and your own code so that it will embed really nicely in the notebook as well. So that's setting up the notebook. Next, let's look at the, the HTML that we need to be embedding that's going to have our map in it. So I, in doing this, I looked at, um, Leaflet and open layers, and probably very similar support for uh, you know whatever mapping library you happen to like to use. The something that's a little bit significant is generally you are specifying your layers as either tile layers or uh, WMS web map service tile layers, um, and the service that we're going to be using to add our data as a layer is going to be a web map service layer. And we do need to care about projections a little bit, which can be a bit of a pain. So a web map service is essentially just an API that anyone's app can, if, if they match this API, they can call themselves a web map service and specify a bunch of parameters and return an image that is a map tile in response. And so this is what a typical request would look like. Um, the three things that are relevant to the data that we're actually asking for is this layers, SRS, and the bounding box, B box. So the SRS is the coordinate reference systems projection, I'm going to say, and the bounding box is just uh, defining the top left and the bottom right hand corner of the, the image that we're asking for. And the only reason really you might need to look at this is because those bounding box coordinates are defined and are, need to be understood with reference to the SRS. So they need to be specified the same. Um, oh, I thought I had some more slides about projections. Maybe that's coming later. Um, so let's talk about PyDAP. Um, uh, OpenDAP is a open standard, an open protocol that was developed originally in the oceanography community but has been adopted by uh, climate scientists and NASA and whoever has this kind of data is a good way to um, transfer gridded data um, over HTTP but it has the benefit that it essentially can do kind of lazy loading and so if you only request a subset of the data it's not going to download the entire file. Um, which is very convenient with large data sets. And for scientists, there's a whole lot of clients that they would have that can read and render um, data according to the DAP <coughs> protocol. And so setting up an open DAP server is a way to make your data available to those people. 
It also means that if you are reading data from an open app server, you don't have to care about, pardon me. You don't have to care about what was the original file type, was it HDF5 or uh, NetCDF or something else. Uh, now PyDAP is also has the code in it to set up your own OpenDAP server. Um, it's just a simple whiskey app and uh, it has a bunch of handlers by default to handle different types of data and you can also install some extra ones. Um, it has this nice uh, proxy handler so you can actually um, show NetCDF files as if they're on your server but really they're just stored somewhere else and you're just kind of routing them through your server. And as well as this DAS, DDS and DODS, they, they kind of define the open DAP protocol. Uh, it will give you by default HTML and ASCII. And so that's nice. You can just look at, use your browser as a client to look at it and uh, investigate what's there. And then you can install extra responses uh, for WMS and KML. And so there, the WMS is so that we can use it as a map layer. And the KML is so that you could view it in something like Google Earth. So this is uh, just kind of showing the architecture of um, PyDAP and as you can see it's very modular. It's actually, I think it's a really nice uh, little project. Um, the documentation is a little sparse but it's very nicely laid out uh, and nice and simple. So installing that and getting that started to run our own server is very simple. Um, there's a template for your own default uh, server, which you can use Paster just to create that. And then literally you're just copying your NetCDF file into the data directory and you're done. You can look at your server with your browser and you'll see the HTML interface by default. And so you'll get an index of your files. This uh, coads.nc is a kind of default uh, one that's just included with PyDAP. And so if you don't have any other data to look at yet, that can be one that you can explore. And you can, you can download the data by specifying all the things you want uh, through the browser. And that could be a good way to do that until you figure out exactly what uh, coordinates you need to specify and then do it programmatically. And it's also got this PyDAP tab so that you can, uh, if you're writing Python and using that as your client library, you can just copy and paste. It couldn't be easier. Ah, okay, so now we will talk about projections. Um, so PyDAP only supports serving uh, WMS tiles in the ESP, EPSG 4326 projection. Um, and this is what is used by most of the people who are producing this kind of um, data in NetCDF files, geese enthusiasts. And the reason that that makes us a little bit unhappy is because nearly all the people who are doing uh, commercial map services like Google Maps, uh, OpenStreetMap are providing them in this other one, 3857 or the, the Google projection. Um, and so I was a little bit sad to discover that um, Leaflet, which, I was, which is what I was originally trying to use, uh, can't doesn't have good support for 4326 for the tile layer. Now a lot of the commercial things are available either as a tile layer or a WMS, but CloudMade is only as a tile layer. So you can use OpenStreetMap because it is available as both in Leaflet or Open Layers, but then, I don't know, they look very similar. You're not, there's practically no difference at that point. Um, so the thing that we need to do is to have both our base layer and our overlays going into our page with the same projection. And so we could either um, transform our whatever, what's coming out of PyDAP um, by setting up a cascading web map service and just use Google Maps as is, um, or we could use a service that is going to transform Google Maps, OpenStreetMap into 4326. There is one service called Metacarta that is in 4326. That's kind of like the default one with open layers and it's really, really ugly, which is why I wanted to use something else. Um, but that actually turns out to be an easier option, I think, because the things that you could use to set up a cascading WMS are kind of 
I was like, oh, this is getting a bit much for something I just want to tinker with on my desktop. So there is this uh, maps.opengeo.org uh, service that has already been set up. And if you look at that, this is where you can use like the get capabilities request in the WMS, and it will actually tell you which um, projections it supports. And so it has OpenStreetMap and NASA Blue Marble, and they're kind of the nicer ones, I think, of the ones that are available. So, okay. Um, that's each of our pieces. Now let's look at what we actually need to write to have this sitting in our uh, in our notebook. Is that reasonably readable for everybody? Yeah. Um, so we're going to use a Genshi template um, to generate a HTML. I just use Genshi because PyDAP is already using it, but you can obviously use whatever templating language you favour. And so this, this uh, HTML property is kind of the, the only thing here. This is like 30 lines, we have this, it's really simple. So we generate our template and then we make an iframe that has that HTML encoded as base64 and then we return that inside the ipython.display.html object. Um, and the reason we have to base64 encode it is because uh, at the moment the notebook doesn't really play well with all that kind of embedded JavaScript um, and it gets a bit confused. So if you have a regular, if you're referring to um, another, like a, an external URL, you don't need to do this. You can just do source equals whatever the address is. Or if you have some really simple HTML that doesn't have JavaScript, you don't need to base64 encode it. Um, but for something like this, we do need to encode it, otherwise it's not going to display properly. And so this is just uh, what we have in our template. Uh, literally the only interesting thing that we're doing is looping through the layers, so the pi for each layer ID, layer name, layer index in layers. Um, they, that's what's getting passed into this object and so we can add as many layers as we need by doing that. And then it's, it's super straightforward. And this is the, the open layers example. On GitHub I have uh, a static example as well with leaflet if you're looking to add all these things together yourself. It's extremely similar API. So then back to the notebook. We just need to import that, um, specify each of the things that we need to point it to. And I actually um, set it up so the defaults are pointing to the the PyDAP uh, test server. So if you don't haven't if you haven't set up PyDAP yourself, you can still do this, um, and you can see the map which just has the coads uh, sea surface temperature on it data on it. Um, so there we go. We have our data in a map in our notebook. Um, there's a couple of things more that maybe would be nice. It would be nice to have the colour table um, on the side that explains what what ranges the colours refer to. I think I had that at one point. I just noticed this morning that it had disappeared. Um, and the the overlays, having multiple layers doesn't really work well, like they don't have any alpha, they just blot each other out. So you can switch between them, but you can't really see more than one at a time. So maybe there's a way to specify that to, to improve that a little bit. But basically we have our data in a map, which is what we wanted. Um, so I looked at a couple of other options to see if there was other ways to do this. I had a bit of a look at GeoDjango because uh, I thought there would be a lot of Django people here and maybe someone would mention it. Um, but it seemed to me that it's not quite uh, concerned with gridded data um, and I couldn't really find many results that suggested it would be worth looking at. So that's probably not the way to go. Uh, now there is work, there is some work already done, I'm not sure if it's released or it's coming very soon to have a HTML5 backend for matplotlib and uh, this is going to be really nice because you can, you'd be able to interact with this graph 
in a way that uh, is very similar to how you can interact with maps in, ter in terms of zooming and panning. So we have pretty much all the, the power with a, it's going to be called web ag backend that we would have with a QT ag or TK ag backend. Um, so this, I'm not sure if this is going to mean that, um, you know, you don't need to embed HTML in the way that I have, although maybe that's still a nice thing to do because using a, you know, a, a JavaScript library that is really designed for um, uh, map layers is still going to give you benefits over this thing, which is not by default uh, aware that it's displaying geographic data. Um, so this whole project kind of came up because my workmate Nathan, who has, was also speaking uh, yesterday, um, basically rolled his own to display gridded data uh, in a map in the notebook. And uh, he was doing his own tile rendering using Pyre sample, and I was looking at it, I was thinking, surely other people have, have done these things already, and surely this is a, a bit of wheel reinventing happening here, and we can do this just by plugging in existing things. And it turns out we can, um, although there's definitely you know, a place for reinventing the wheel. So if you're interested in looking at Python code to essentially build a web map service, take a look at LeafViz on GitHub. Um, I'm sure he would accept any pull requests there as well. And thanks to some other people who helped me, especially with the mapping things. Um, and that's all I have time. Uh, that's all I have to say, so I think we have lots of time for questions. Um, okay, so thanks very much. Um, right at the beginning, you had mentioned that there's uh, the roadmap for IPython has plans to add th options other than HTML. There's like uh, ping and other image format outputs. Was that did I interpret that correctly? Uh, actually, those things are already there, but they're planning to add better support for JavaScript. Is my understanding? Oh, sorry. So, so it's the JavaScript that's the addition, right? Okay. Um, I was just I know you can't speak for the IPython team or anything, but um, based upon your history of using Notebook. Um, when they say on their roadmap, what sort of time frame are we talking about? Uh, I would expect to see it in the next year because they got like a bunch of money and I've seen a lot of... Things happen, yeah, okay. Yeah, things are happening pretty quickly. Right. And uh, even when I was um, debugging this, I was complaining to one of them that the iframe thing wasn't working properly and they said, oh, you should be using uh, ipython.display.iframe and I was like, that doesn't exist and he was like, oh, maybe it's not released yet. Okay. So I suspect that there's going to be a lot better things in the toolkit uh, to come and I wouldn't, I think Nathan is already running uh, 0.14 with the notebook, like a development version, so I, yeah, I don't know when, but there is a, if you yeah, Google for uh, IPython roadmap um, on GitHub, there's a document and they took, there's a lot of detail about the plans and what they're hoping to do. Sure. Okay, thanks. Hi. Hi, Brianna, Frank. The, um, I'm looking at uh, Safari.org Tager server. Have you come across that? It's a net CDF server. What is it called? Uh, Tager, T-A-I-G-A. -A. Okay, no. No. It's a product out of NASA. It's Python, written in Python, and essentially gives you um, like a file system over your NetCDF file system, and you can again subset it as you pull the stuff out. Uh, okay. Probably worth a quick look. Sure. Thanks. Sure. Any other questions? Is iframe the preferred approach in order to get? A JavaScript chart, or could you do something like transform the Python list into JavaScript list and then get something on the page right away? Is that approach right at all? Sorry, can you say again? In order to get an external chart like D3 chart or a leaf face map, uh, is I iframe a preferred approach, or could you use something like passing the lists in Python into a JavaScript list and then asking the browser to render that in the form of a graph? Uh, I'm not really sure. I'm not sure I totally understand what you're saying, so maybe we can talk about it afterwards. Sure, that's good. No uh, 
Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Um, how easy is it to kind of go from your data sets in a different format to put them into a net CDF or some kind of applicable data set to use with the DAP tools, that kind of thing? Uh, to convert your data? Uh, well, PyDAP actually has a net CDF uh, response plugin, so you could possibly use PyDAP to kind of convert it on the fly, um, which is a little bit roundabout way of doing it. Um, I think the thing with PyDAP, like it depends what your format is, but because it's supporting HDF5 and it's like it's supposed to be a little bit agnostic to whatever your data format is. So I would look at, is there a handler for it already? Like, do you actually need to convert it? Maybe you don't need to convert it. Um, and if you do need to convert it, uh, yeah, you'd probably be best to talk to Ed Schofield. I think he would be the guy who knows the most about which library to use. Thanks, Brianna. Do you have one of these sitting on your laptop at the moment you can show us? Yes, I do. So here I have um, uh, my IPython notebooks in the bottom one are running and my PyDAP server in the top window is running. And then this is my um, my PyDAP server, which I've just, yeah, have the same data on that I showed it before. And so uh, then with my notebooks, I've got um, three different ones. So if we look at um, reading the data, can I page down, maybe? Yep. So this is what I was talking about um, using notebooks to explore APIs. So if you just do the default I am show data, you get this thing and you're like, hmm, I can kind of see where Tasmania is there, but that's not really that useful to me. Um, and then you kind of look at the options and you're like, oh, okay, or I can set origin lower and then it's like at least up the right way. And then, okay, I can set vmin, it's like values min, values max, because the Unfortunately, this data set doesn't have like a proper NAN value that's representing no data, which is what the blue is. It's got like, you know, minus 32,000, whatever that number is that's like where, I think it's where, you know, the number where integers roll over or 32 bit inches roll over. Um, so we said Vmin and Vmax and then we get a much more sensible uh, range of colors. And then by setting the extent, we're kind of telling it about what, uh, what is the distance between each of our grid points. So they may not be square, which is why our data originally looks a bit squished. And then when we set the extent, it actually looks a bit more sensible. Uh, and then we can do this zoom in, but we can't really um, yeah, interact with it apart from that. Uh, and then with our embedded ones, oh, that's the simple one. Um, so like another option aside from uh, generating the HTML and keeping it in just essentially in memory, if you write files out under the same directory where your IPython notebooks were started, the IPython notebook will actually serve them up under slash files. So if we open a new tab. Um, which is something to keep in mind, like don't start your IPython notebooks under like slash home because then everything in your <laughs> home directory is kind of available. So, well, we can't just browse around, but if we have, if we know that, oh, okay, I think I don't have any of that directory, but if you save, you can just save your file out actually in the same directory and then you have this slash files address and then you don't need to do the base64 encoding because you can just refer to it as a regular source directory. And so this is the default one. If um, this is the coeds data from the test PyDAP server. Um, and yeah, it's really it's not as detailed as the other data set I was using, so I liked it a bit more. Um, yeah, so. Uh, that's 
not going all the way, but it is going quite a bit of the way to have a nice, uh, nicer um, display as, are oh, they both mint temp? Yeah. So you can set up, you can add as many um, files as you need. And I also found out um, that PyDAP has a handler called NCA, which is NetCDF aggregation. So for example, for this MinTemp and MaxTemp, I've actually got two separate NetCDF files, but it's kind of annoying. I'd like to, because they have the same, you know, lats and longs, so really I would like them to just be layers in, in a single file. So it has this, if you install pydab.handlers.nca, it can actually, you can just define like a, a .ini file that says how to aggregate them. And then anybody can uh, hit, hit that address and it will act as if they were in a single file, essentially. So I think, um, yeah, the PyDAP author was very helpful and I think he's actually intending to split PyDAP into two separate libraries, one just the client and one just the server. And he's gonna rewrite the server as a really simple Flask app and I think that'll uh, make it really easy to extend as well when we see that. And I think that's definitely my time. So thank you. Thank you again, Brianna Law.